Hello, everyone. Um, welcome. Uh, we're so excited to have you today for digital evidence in the prosecution of queerness in Lebanon, Egypt, and Tunisia. Um, so this is a program hosted by uh, the program on the law, law and society in the Muslim world and co-sponsored by the Cyber Law Clinic and the LGBT. LGBTQ plus uh, clinic. I'm Kendra Albert. I'm a clinical instructor in the Cyber Law Clinic, and I have the awesome honor of moderating this conversation today with my uh, friend, inspiration, colleague, Afsana Ragot, um, who's a senior researcher at Article 19 and affiliate of the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. And she researches law, technology, human rights, and corporate responsibility. Um, so before I turn things over to her, um, I'm just going to sort of lay out some ground rules and uh, sort of the, the how to how the our next hour together is going to unfold. So Afsana's we will have her video off for um, security reasons. So I'm just going to uh, uh, also turn my video off during her presentation, so you don't have to you know witness all of my emoting instead of focusing on her. Um, but then I'll turn my video back on once we get to Q and A. Um, there will be a short Q and A after, um, so we'll probably try to wrap up our portion of the presentation by about um, 12, 40, 40 or 45, and then make sure we have ton plenty of time for the audience questions. Um, you can feel free to answer questions in the Q&A box at any time um, as they occur to you, and we'll get to them in the second half. And then finally, um, this will be recorded and posted after. So if you want to share all of uh, the incredible insights that you get from Afsana's research, um, there you'll, it'll be easy, easy to link to. Um, so with all of that, uh, please, Asana, take it away and tell us about digital evidence in the prosecution of queerness in Lebanon, Egypt, and Tunisia. Thank you, Kendra, for that. And thank you, everyone, for joining um, from all your different time zones. I'm going to share my slides with you in just a second. Um, I did want to say that what we were playing at the beginning as people were rolling in was um, a great song by Mashra Leila um, called Roman that is by a band um, in Lebanon with Hamid Sinu, who became one of the like, the um one of the most openly queer um musicians in the region the song itself it's really important and beautiful they have many beautiful songs that talk about politics intersectionality queerness but also the song in itself talks about this um stereotyping of our region and um this concept of the way we are seen as victims and the concept of victimhood rather than the strength within um the communities that we come from. One of the really great quotes from them that I want to encapsulate some of the work we have going on here is an explainer of this video itself when they say that they want a way out of treating and um, they want to stop treating oppression as not a source of victimhood, but as a fertile ground from which resistance can be weaponized. Also important to this is the concept that um, Mashra Leila are playing a concert in Egypt in 2017 led to one of the biggest crackdowns on the queer community that again links back to the use of digital evidence and the pictures and shown shared from there. Um, and one of the folks who was um, arrested at the uh, concert in 2017 was um, Sarah Hirazi, who we would want to pay tribute to May she rest in power. So um, here we go. I'm going to try and keep it as short as possible um, and go through because there's a lot of um, information to get through. I'm Afsana Rigo. Thank you again, Kendra, for that very kind introduction. Um, I work at Article 19's Middle East and North Africa team, and I'm an affiliate at the Beckman Client Center where this research on digital evidence in the prosecution of queerness in Lebanon and Egypt began. So um, the sort of genesis and the foundation of this work comes from um, research with Article 19 that started around 2016, where we looked at the methods of arrest and uh, targeting and harassment with the use of technology and the impact of technology in contexts that it wasn't designed for, particularly the impact on queer communities in these three countries. And um, I have the link there. I think my colleagues will also share the link with you. 
um, to the report itself and some of the resources from it. But that report um, provided the foundation of understanding how arrests happen, how things like queer dating apps themselves are used um, against people and how um, folks want to see changes within um, the companies themselves, the security changes and what sort of needs and wants the community themselves had. Um, so you can go have a look at that. I won't go into a lot of the detail on that. That's for another talk. So understanding, um, understanding digital evidence and how identity is prosecuted. I think what I want to do in this talk is give you an overview of how fundamental digital evidence becomes in these cases and how um, this, these criminalizations occur and how easy it is to create this um, evidence base around identity based on what we have in our personal devices. Um, so what is digital evidence? Um, it is data created, manipulated, or stored um, or communicated by any device, computer, or computer system transmitted over a communication system that is used in a proceeding. This is my adapted version of the um, Stefan Mason definition in, uh, I'm sorry, I think that just stopped sharing. There we go. Um, definition in 2008, I slightly um, amended that to fit this report in itself. Um, a note on the report, the report itself will come out sometime in 2021, fingers crossed. Um, but I made it a strategy pretty early on that um, it would be important to share, uh, share a lot of the information and the findings from it from quite onset of some of the important um, patterns and um, information that was coming in rather than waiting for the report itself to come out because it's a lengthy process and the things that are coming out are important to share um, not just to wait for some flashy publication. Um, so I will keep everyone updated when that's out but here are some elements of that with regards to digital evidence again it's something that um, looks to link together people and events in time and space to establish causality for crimes or civil wrongs so that's a very formal um basis for what digital evidence is in this why is it important i i want to go to this quote from one of the incredible lawyers in lebanon um, who encapsulates the importance of digital evidence when it comes to these cases currently and what it's providing right now. And they say you are providing evidence for something that's usually very hard to find evidence for because LGBT individuals, even for example, any type of sexual crime is something that happens behind closed doors in private. And um, by nature of the crime is something that's not very easy to prove. So at this stage, digital evidence is actually providing a new type of evidence, is providing evidence for something that was really impossible to prosecute before. So that kind of encapsulates the fundamentality of digital evidence in these cases. And having that in mind, what becomes a scene of the crime in the cases that we've been studying and looking at is a phone or laptop, predominantly phones. These cases arise um, and arise frequently, and it's this patchwork of apps, photos, messages from devices that form this central evidence for the material elements of these crimes um, based on the criminal procedures in each country. And they are, if not in all cases, they are in most of the cases. I haven't seen any cases that don't have any um, that are recent. Um, so digital evidence is in fact become a current cornerstone of prosecuting queerness. Just a little outline of the laws. I'm not going to go through them um, too much, but uh, you get this idea of the sort of a myriad of laws that are in each of these case study countries. Again, none of these countries are unique in prosecuting marginalized communities and the queer community. But in um, Lebanon, Egypt, and Tunisia, you have these um, outlines of the laws that provide for it and provide for the police to abuse these, uh, abuse these like vague concepts and outlines in each um, country for prosecutions and the court systems to allow for them. As you can see, 
um, in Egypt, the main law is the combating of prostitution law and Article 14 and 9 are the main laws used in that sense, where they cover the engagement in debauchery, which requires an act to be committed. And when there is no proof of an sexual act being committed, an incitement, which is usually about advertising or seduction is used. And often that is based around every single piece of evidence such as pictures, chats, and so on that come in. There is this move to the economic courts in Egypt that is very concerning because there are broader laws that are applied with higher um, sentences around values and principles of Egyptian society and a legitimate means of using telecommunication correspondence. So we're seeing these now as of last year more in these um, cases again touching upon the importance of digital evidence and how the legal system and the police are optimizing on that uh, in lebanon again a very vague um, article in the penal code that is mainly used which is about any sexual intercourse contrary to the order of nature as you can imagine that is very broad very wide it's always challenged and is often used in these cases and there are a myriad of other laws that come in that particularly impact um, very vulnerable members of the community, such as the trans and sex worker um, community members even more so. Tunisia a little bit more direct with the Arabic text of it talking about um, uh, any sort of sex between um, men and between women. So it's more about same sex relations and its definitions as it provides it in the Arabic version. Um, and there are other elements that are used from that penal code. Just to note, most of these laws that we're talking about here are remnants of colonial laws that have remained in their um, penal systems and criminal systems. So once again, thank you, colonialism. Um, going back to the scope that we are looking at here. So we're talking about um, a good number of cases in each country that it's very, it's very hard to get a full picture of how many cases in how many um, districts are happening all the time. The incredible NGOs on the ground and the um, teams working frontline are under-resourced and overworked. However, there are some uh, statistics that we can work on around here. Um, Badaya's reports show that between 2018-2019 um, there's an average of 85 cases that they see and they document. Um, again, this does not cover the array of cases, but this is what they have uh, in Lebanon and um, uh, Helem and uh, Human Rights Watch report around 70 cases between the years. Again, 2020 is a different one. It's an uh, anomaly to try and um, use as a uh, indicator of patterns. So I've left that out. In Tunisia, it's been a lot harder to try and get any statistics. The um, NGOs and researchers and experts on the ground and um, the lawyers themselves talk about how difficult it is in a very um, decentralized court system to get any sort of statistics on the numbers that are happening. But in our interviews and in every interview I've conducted, there is one number that every lawyer seems to land on in terms of the number of cases they're seeing. And this is the number I'm gonna try and um, refer to based on their own experiences. And they, they estimate it's around 100 cases a year. There's a lot going on in this slide. I'm not very good at <laughs> doing slides, but bear with me. So um, what kind of uh, research did I do for this um, and how did I gain this data? Aside from doing an analysis of the laws from the penal to the cyber laws that become implicated in this, in this report, we will have uh, an analysis of 21 interviews then with the main lawyers um, in each country, so seven from each country. And these are the, the, there aren't tens and tens of lawyers working on these cases. There are a number of very prominent, very skilled human rights and criminal lawyers that are taking on these cases. And I think I can confidently say I've pretty much interviewed the main um, uh, people involved in these cases in each country. Um, and I've also currently, it's ongoing and reviewed 24 court files um, that range from um, 2015 to 2020 um, 
nine in Tunisia, 12 in Egypt, three in Lebanon. I'm getting another seven, it seems, tomorrow. So it's, it's just going to miss this talk. Um, it's been very hard getting the Lebanese case file. So in those cases, reviewing how digital evidence becomes involved in um, the way the prosecuting team presents it. So just some insight, broad line insight into what sort of patterns we're seeing. In terms of arrests, um, with that structure of the laws that I provided for you in terms of arrests where, and um, methods used by police and investigating teams to identify individuals, we're looking at in Egypt street level arrests. So this is where groups of police with um, profile survey and profile individuals whilst they're going through very predominant um, queer hangouts um, or are being um, directed by informants. These could be informants who are either paid or coerced into becoming um, informants who um, might help them uh, identify individuals. Entrapments. Entrapments, many of you might know about, is a very sophisticated um, operation within the Egyptian police not one that they are uh, ashamed of and it's very um, openly talked about often is where um, police officers use queer dating apps predominantly queer dating apps to create catfishing profiles and effectively start sexting uh, arrange a meeting point start meeting if they meet someone and they'll arrest them. In the case files and interviews, um, they're always the police and the prosecuting team will always talk about this as being done by informants or private consultants. Um, we can talk about this in more detail later, but this again provides this sort of immunity to the police because often a lot of the things we're talking about are done illegally without warrants, without any sort of um, court uh, appointed um, provisions to uh, 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 search devices and so on, or even conduct these sort of um, uh, uh, operations. So saying it's an informant is a bit of a um, loophole, something that happens also in the US. Public buildings such as hotels and so on, so reports from um, um, for public folks in different public buildings and private buildings that bring in the police, Lebanon, um, one of the main patterns of cases you'll see is parallel cases. That means someone coming in um, under a different charge, say a drugs charge or a assault charge, or even coming in to report a crime. Um, officers in that uh, uh, police station or wherever they are reporting will then profile an individual, get suspicious, or it somehow get access to their devices. And if they see something in there that um, provides them suspicion of queerness, they bring in a parallel case under Article 534 that we looked at. A lot of the cases, as the lawyers um, uh, mentioned, and as the files have been showing in Tunisia and Lebanon, are parallel cases. Again, this adds to the difficulty of getting statistics on numbers, especially when they start as a different um, case against them. Again, checkpoints, so military and police checkpoints and stop and search using and abusing powers uh, without warrants to then go through private devices and um, such as phones, which will then, again, if something is seen on there, like a court dating app or pictures and stuff could lead to arrest. Uh, reports of it and um, sort of entrapments through um, apps, not a systematic thing like it is in Egypt. However, there have been reports of it and some of the lawyers have mentioned having clients who have been uh, arrested through them. Again, reports by people, um, neighbours and so on. Uh, Tunisia, similarly parallel cases, as I mentioned in Lebanon, stop and search. Um, again, it, they have further powers for stop and search with the current state of emergency um, uh, laws there through apps. Again, um, with something we saw again last year and we'll put in the reports, it doesn't seem to be a systematic orchestrated thing, but it happens. And reports by neighbours and individuals based on how they profile um, their sort of Pre, um, prejudice around these um, cases and individuals they see. Um, again, they all lead to interrogation, device confiscation, and gaining of um, information on those. Um, however, with entrapments, they've already gathered that information. What becomes digital evidence? 
let's quickly look at this. From uh, the interviews in Egypt, I, I wanted to give you some uh, very quick quotes from some of the lawyers about what they see becoming digital evidence and this picture that pretty much anything can become digital evidence in these cases. Um, something like a gay dating app on your phone is evidence enough, even if you have like naked pictures of yourself, like you only as, are standing in front of a mirror being naked, this can also be used as evidence, so you see that's the sort of framework. With online trapment, they always try and make the person send pictures, and pictures would be dated, so that date becomes very useful in the court file, and they need the conversation in a way that they can say that they ask for money, and we can discuss that later. The money conversation comes in quite a lot because the law is based, and it's called the law in combating prostitution. That's how they frame it. So, and then another lawyer talks about any personal photos that indicate that the individual has done any sort of debauchery, even with friends, conversation with friends, anything that indicates being gay or involved in debaucheral acts. 83% um, of the case files I reviewed talk about the use of messages from um, messaging uh, applications such as WhatsApp. Often they're described as being um, sexual in nature. That's very debatable, um, but that's how they're uh, described by prosecuting teams. They often include sex and nudes. Um, again, with the, the amount of use of WhatsApp in these cases, they also talk about the use of SIM cards. The SIM card helps them connect the phone number and the identity of an individual to the WhatsApp um, profile of a person. And there are like, you know, um, examples of interrogations talking about the SIM card number and the phone number and the WhatsApp chat. Photos, 50% of the cases, uh, I look at mentioned photos, are often um, defined by the prosecuting team or the investigating officers as being feminine or nude selfies. So very, very, very open to the interpretation of these officers of what they deem to be non-normative in their own perception. So anything becomes used from the phone galleries and even WhatsApp chats. Dating apps, 66% of them mention dating apps, and there's this whole plethora of different dating apps that they use. Um, who's here? 50% of them mention who's here. Who is here? I don't know who they are, but the police love this app. The police love using this app. The police love just mentioning this app. Even if they're providing evidence from Grindr, for example, they might say they found it on who's here. Tunisia, similarly, this um, concept of um, sometimes uh, they'll even use logos of LGBT organization as a form of uh, indication of a person's identity. It's that kind of logic. This lawyer mentions they're looking for photos and conversations. Um, sometimes they try and get a confession, but even if they don't have that confession, they'll rely on these photos and conversations. And they'll read, and another lawyer talks about, read your Facebook messages. In Tunisia, it's very much around Facebook Messenger. Uh, look at your pictures. By law, they don't have this authorization to do that, but they force and look at everything and conversations of all your private life as if it's their own. Again, 67% of um, the case files I reviewed mentioned Messenger apps even if they're just flirty messages or just messages that are just any way um, with emotion attached to them, like I like you or you look nice, they come up in the case files. Videos, 33% of them talk about um, explicit videos, 55% of them talk about um, photos uh, of these cases. And again, bringing in this concept always written down as being too feminine or effeminate in the photos, they always put that in there. Lebanon, again, any sort of romantic conversation or voice notes, and um, they'll be used in them. Obviously, the lawyers challenge these things, but they're used in the court file. They're bringing something like Grindr. They don't know what it is. They know or have an assumption that if you have Grindr on your phone, that you are gay. So they dig further and find what else is on your phone. The third um, lawyer here talks about the uh, extreme xenophobia and further privacy um, invasions that Syrians have faced in her cases. Um, sexing is something that always triggers um, more prosecutions in all of the cases, Syrian or not. Again, they're looking at all the types of messaging, um, sexting in specific, grinder, anything that insinuates this sort of um, level of identity. 
in the <laughs> bear with me i've put percentages here but they're just three files um just for continuity so two of the three files that i've reviewed so far mentioned whatsapp again same concept as um tunisia and lebanon one of the files i looked at even used the contact name that one of the um, accused had used for someone else that they were being accused of having uh, under the law unnatural um, sexual intercourse with because they named the contact honey okay and social media searches although they didn't put that in the court file in Lebanon often um, as one of the lawyers explains they're too lazy to put these things in the court file because they don't need it and then they'll get confessions based on everything that they find in the phones again confessions in all three cases again in these confessions they bring in this bizarre narrative that they force people to give, that they've been abused in the past, they have some sort of hormonal deficit to kind of create this illness perception of queerness within the court files and for the judge. Um, in every single um, interview I had, they mentioned this and in the three files I've seen it too, and it happens in the other countries. Like I mentioned, there's variance in the sort of sexual nature of things, like just highlighting that Tunisia that any conversation about love or sex or intimacy is proof enough. Um, sometimes they add non-digital elements of evidence, such as condoms, lubricants, clothing, again, by their own definitions that they assume is effeminate. They always like put effeminate clothing in the files and money, money becomes um, added in there to kind of create this visceral um, element to the narrative and gain judgments and reactions. Here, Egypt, 75% of the cases and um, case files mention money and other clothing items, and 33% in Tunisia mentioned money and clothing. Importantly, to point out here, there's no sophisticated software that we've detected in this research. Every time I've asked any of the lawyers, were there any sophisticated targets and um, software used for this, they laugh at me, no there wasn't they don't need to they have everything they need on those phones no direct data from companies as of yet nothing that indicates that even if they had made requests to companies that they did gain any sort of access to data held from um dating apps or uh, messenger tools again to say they don't need it and um, they use everything they find on the phone to create this um so finally, I just want to say that part of the project in itself is talking about um, these other issues that are being faced with a legal system that provides this and there are responsibilities from the companies that become very implicated in these cases. Everything becomes based on creating a case through the evidence that's found on these phones. And from our Article 19 research we did where the communities and users and the incredible local NGOs told us what they want to see change from the company side of things on these apps for safety and protection, the lawyers repeat the same things um, and that provides for it. So I'll leave that here. There's this concept of generally designing with these cases in mind with privacy and security in mind that I really want to um, add this note. It shouldn't be fully on the community and on these um, NGOs and lawyers to constantly work to protect. They should be provided with the tools they need and have responded to the needs that they have to be able to protect and defend themselves against this sort of oppression. So I want to say with that, thank you. I, a huge thank you to everyone that's helped me with this, from Madaya to Helen to Legal Agenda, to all my colleagues on the ground that, that have been working to help me get case files. People like Senda, Noura, uh, Remba, everybody. I, I won't mention all the lawyers' names as I haven't gotten permission for safety reasons, but there's so many people I need to thank and I hope this report comes out soon. Uh, those are my contact emails if you need that, but I'm going to stop there so we can have a lovely conversation with Kendra. Amazing, Afsana. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. I think it's uh, like each time you present this work, I sort of get to, I, I'm excited to kind of get to hear more about it and dig into it more and get a better understanding of the dynamics. I want to sort of just like start by touching on the sort of what you mentioned about the kind of um, colonial aspect of the these laws and I think 
as someone who like is rooted in US LGBTQ rights work, I think it can be tempting to sort of think of this as like a over there problem. But mm -hmm. actually when you were, when we first talked about this work, one of the things that really came up for me um, was uh, Dale Carpenter in his book, Flagrant Conduct, which is about Lawrence v. Texas, which is the, the US case involving um, uh, striking down anti-sodomy laws in the US as unconstitutional actually like basically articulates something very similar to some of the stuff that I think you're, you saw in your research, which is that, you know, the, uh, the sort of archetypal case of Lawrence v. Texas, where you know, two gay men were supposedly having sex, it's actually pretty likely that they weren't having sex, or at least that they weren't having sex when the police showed up, but rather that, you know, evidence was sort of constructed against them. Um, and in the case of Lawrence v. Texas, the advocates actually found it useful to not uh, contest that because they wanted to uh, claim, they wanted to bring a case about anti-sodomy law being unconstitutional. So I think it's just like so important to just emphasize this, the connections and the way in which, you know, prosecutions of queerness are not unique, first of all, certainly not unique to the uh, MENA or these countries, but also that, you know, the way in which these, this aligns with police behavior in the United States. Um, Thank you for that. Um, so that was a comment, not a question. So I'm already breaking <laughs> all the rules. Um, but I wanted to ask, I know that you've like talked to the lawyers a lot about how police sort of engage with these kinds of digital evidence, and especially if they're breaking into people's phones. Um, are they, are police like fabricating evidence at all? Or is all of it sort of real and just used against, um, against the queer folks in ways that they might not have, uh, uh, been able to, um, see coming so it's it's very um hard for the lawyers themselves and um the defense teams to prove that sort of fabricated evidence but there is definitely this pattern that i'm seeing especially in egypt where um uh, there are notes that there's an accepted part of the norm that police do engage this in this sort of behavior again like you say as police do world around abusing power in any way possible to gain the conviction they want to get um, so I've had some really interesting um, views of some of the cases provided for example there was one case um, in particular we've spoken about is that they as I mentioned they love this app who's here anyone in this conversation if you know who's here please bring them in my direction because I need to have a chat with them but um so they mentioned who's here they said we were surfing the internet our consultant as i mentioned was surfing the internet and found this profile uh, of the, who was um, advertising debauchery online the defense team pointed out who's here is a geolocation based communication app you can't surf the internet and find anyone on that this is a fabrication the court eventually the judge and the appeal judge accepted that they accepted that and basically said, this is fabricated evidence, I'm going to um, throw this case out, which is such an indicator of that this is a common thing. It was such an um, interesting judgment there to be like, okay, this is one of those fabricated evidences. But, you know, it's hard to tell how often these happened. And um, one of the lawyers told me about a strategy that they had provided um, that they had started to use to highlight the sort of police practices was creating this um, uh, uh, fake report on this app that creates fake WhatsApp conversations in front of the judge, going in front of the judge and being like, this is how easy it is to create a fake WhatsApp conversation. Let's talk about the fact that this could be a fabricated case. And I asked this person, this lawyer, which I was so impressed by the strategy. I know that every lawyer has different strategies and there are like the human rights based strategies that um, are most used. But this this was like a quite a rogue strategy that I really liked. I asked, does it work? And they laughed and said, sometimes. <laughs> so it does get by. Um, and I know it happens um, when talking to Tunisian lawyers, for example, they mentioned that even if the evidence is gathered illegally and illegal gathering of evidence and searching of devices is just common throughout each country. It's just, there are no warrants. There are no warrants anywhere. Um, they mentioned that the report of the police is uh, treated as a, a holy document 
to, it's not questioned whether it's fake or not. It's they. I've had at least four of them mention that it's a holy document, so it won't get questioned. So again, to answer your question, there is a pattern. It's hard to challenge, but police be police. I love, yeah, you know, the world over, right? Um, I love the idea of the of the of the lawyer going to the judge with like the fake WhatsApp conversation and being like, look, here's a WhatsApp conversation judge that says you gave me an extension on this briefing, right? Like, you know, um uh, yeah, exactly. like uh, but yeah, I mean, I think it's a really um, you know, I think a lot of uh, you know, even within the US and prosecutions in the US, uh Prosecutors are often relying on the idea that either defense counsel or um, uh, judges don't necessarily know how these technologies work. And so it can be really effective to prevent, present evidence that says, hey, like actually, you know, the evidence you're introducing is like not, not plaus plausible. Yeah, um, I think one thing I would, sorry, I would add at the end of that is that one thing that seems to be very common in these cases is this note that. Um, there's a clumsiness in the way uh, evidence is gathered because they just know they can get the convictions they want to do. There isn't much um, sophisticated um, evidence gathering happening here. Um, like in that who's here um, case that I mentioned, the judge knew more about who's here than the police, you know? So there is also that element that they're just trying to get the charge. So I have more questions, but we have a bunch of fantastic questions in the Q&A. So I'm actually gonna kind of start switching back and forth a little um, uh, between those and sort of my kind of bigger picture questions. Um, moderator's privilege here. Um, so uh, anonymous attendee asks, can you provide more clarity on like stop and search checkpoints? And is that how they're reviewing app slash data devices? So, which I think is a great question. Could you talk more about how the police are getting access to like the phone or the laptop? Right, exactly. Um, that that's definitely how they're getting access to the devices and information. So stop and search powers, depending on the country, um, the police will have different levels of stop and search powers. They still don't have um the legal right to be um entering the devices. That that still requires some sort of court order to get into the devices in each country. Although they still do. So stop and search. What will happen is someone is profiled. Let's say on street level surveillance and um, someone is identified the police officer or a checkpoint military officer will think hey this person looks like someone that I want to get into the data of whether in Lebanon for example this really impacts the trans community and really impacts um, Syrian refugees um, and then it's forced access and you know I think we all understand that when it comes to that sort of power dynamic a lot of people can't say no you open the phone um, often maybe they'll see what we saw in the Article 19 research, for example, in Lebanon was like the first thing they would see is the logo of an app. That would lead to further searches, looking at the pictures, looking at the apps, and that's when someone gets arrested and then there's a full search of the device and like printing out of things from the device. So um, hopefully that's answered the question, but basically they ask for the individual, very, very, you know, traditional police and um, stop and search tactics. Give me your phone, open it up. I'm going to go into it. Let me see. You're arrested. Let's go look at the rest. Thank you. Yeah, I think that helps sort of give a, a fuller picture for folks who might not be able to sort of contextualize or imagine um, how that sort of would unfold. I'm actually going to jump to a question, which I think in some ways we've been kind of talking about. Um, and I think this sort of has to do with like the relationship between kind of theory and practice, maybe a little bit. Um, so an anonymous attendee asks, hey, isn't this like uh, prohibited by international bodies such as the United Nations and like the human rights? Yeah. Um, uh, or sorry, and like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? Like, you know, how does international human rights law interact with these like sort of potential individual prosecutions or these methods of evidence gathering? So interestingly, especially depending on the lawyers, so I always ask about their defense strategy in these cases because I really want to understand how they're trying to defend in these cases and how to, um, in the sort of impact or anything I can bring, um, uh, the sort of teams can support them in getting defense for these teams. And they often mention 
especially in Lebanon um, in different places, they mentioned that they do talk about international conven um, conventions, especially if the country is uh, a treaty um, member to them. So they'll bring in different conventions that the country has signed. They'll bring in this concept of the fact that what was being done is against the sort of elements of the conventions and um, that they've signed to is beyond just Declaration of Human Rights, the um, ICCPR and so on doesn't get far um, because there is this um, broad stroke of um, the legal provisions in the penal system that basically allows them to bypass that. One of the interesting things that I've heard is that often they also um, challenge this concept that queerness is a Western um, ideology and that it doesn't belong in the country and so on, that some very conservative members of the police or the judiciary might bring up. So they might not even rely on international conventions to challenge these things or rely on um, national uh, bodies of law that basically prove that the laws themselves are very much faulty or too vague to apply. Um, but realistically, from a procedural point of view, what the lawyers do to challenge the police and the way they do um, this sort of uh, uh, abuse of power is often bring in procedural elements of the law. You have not indicated that there's been any sexual act committed here. A selfie is not prohibited under a law. Saying I like you is not enough to commit anyone. So they're having to kind of work within the system itself to challenge these cases to get acquittals and then bringing in the broader human rights conversation to basically realistically get a, um, of a lower charge or an acquittal. So, yeah. That makes a ton of sense. And to be honest, I think it really lines up with what I think, you know, public defenders and other defense attorneys do in the United States, which is like, even if you think that something might be a violation of like international law or human rights, uh, the your client's human rights, like, that's not the first thing I would argue in front of a judge, right? So I think that right. like, you know, legal systems, uh, you know, cops are cops, the world's over and legal systems are legal systems, the world's over, which means, you know, oftentimes those procedural remedies are going to be more effective at kind of getting things resolved quickly. And that makes a ton of sense. I, yeah, I think in, in just, um, just to pinpoint on the Lebanon side, the human rights conversation and the fact that the law itself is so broad, like um, sexual acts in contrary to that of um, nature is so broad. Many judgments have um, sided with the human rights lawyers on this. It's just there is no precedent setting in the sort of French system that Lebanon has. So they're not working on this precedent system of being able to use those cases, but it is being used. It's just not the most... Um, successful it seems from what I'm seeing. Uh, so that actually brings me to a really fantastic question um, that someone asked about Lebanese LGBTQ organizations um, sort of coming up with a model defense and in particular legal agenda who awesome folks um, and if that was a uh, 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 Afi that was the folks you had a conversation with about movement lawyering right? Right. Yes. Yumna. Yumna. Uh, yeah. Uh, so if you haven't watched that, we'll throw the I'll throw the link in chat in a second. I really highly recommend. Oh, uh, yeah. The, the, there's two. There's two with legal engine. I'm sorry. There's another one with Karim Yumna and Harik from um, Halem and um, one learn with Yumna. But definitely, yes. Please do drop that. Okay. So we will we will throw out those. But uh, other than this is not just a moment of total uh, fandom for the legal agenda, folks. Uh, we're asking about sort of their implementation and development of a model defense and how has that approach impacted communities in terms of arrests or prosecution, which I also think corresponds to one of the broader questions I have, which is like, how is this stuff changing over time as, as you've been looking at these cases? Yeah, it's it's really it's a great question because what um, legal agenda, for example, has been doing, and I know teams um, uh, less coordinated, but and in the inception of it in Egypt and Tunisia are doing similar things. Is having this sort of um, concept of a model defense, how to defend against um, these arguments for by police and so on. It is really helping, especially with new lawyers. As I mentioned, there aren't so many um, legal defense lawyers working on these cases. So providing this tool book to, um, for them on how to defend on these cases. Importantly, I think uh, 
and please go listen to that talk. It's um, really incredible to listen to the sort of work um, folks have been doing in Lebanon. One of the judgments that they uh, had in Lebanon, which was pro basically scrapping um, 534, used, uh, and you know, Yubna talks about this, they used that legal defense um, that, that had been created by a legal agenda as a framework to providing that judgment. So they're really important. I know uh, in different ways it's happening in different places. Um, so that movement, and I'm hoping, I'm hoping if one thing that I can do with some of this digital evidence work is to create something similar about challenging specifically digital evidence um, and having um, maybe a regional, a cross-regional strategy sharing when it comes to that, because folks have some incredible strategies when it comes to challenging this stuff. And I think it helps. In terms of broader patterns I'm seeing, um, one thing that's very concerning, uh, and I think it was part of the hypothesis of the research, you know, I mean, Kendra, we've spoken about this uh, issue of sometimes you have a research hypothesis that you hope is not true. And sadly, this was true, and we're seeing it more and more that there is this con continued digitization of these prosecutions and reliance on digital tools. And I think what is happening in Lebanon is a great indicator of that. The move to the economic courts that um, we were seeing in the interviews and um, uh, places like Bodaya are also documenting is that is a very um, concerning uh, shift right now because the economic courts have the jurisdiction to use um, articles from the cyber laws and the telecommunication laws and the articles that are being used from the cyber laws and the telecommunication laws are very weak. So the sort of the legal defenses and the sort of strategies the lawyers had created during this time now needs to change. Like uh, interviewing one of the lawyers on this, they were like, now we can't get the acquittals we were going to get. The only way we're getting acquittals in these cases in the economic courts right now is for procedural means. For example, if they put down the right wrong date in something, because the charges under these new laws are uh, amping up um, the um, penalties and the sentences and they're so vague, it's hard to challenge them. But the good news on that, and like Nura, my colleague from Cairo 52 points out, and maybe we can share that article in Slate, and that the lawyers and the legal teams will adapt to this new change too, and then make things harder for them once again. So um, I think there is a specific shift, again, focusing on digital evidence and how easy it makes it for them basically to criminalize identity and how to optimize that and I from my understanding of how things work and I've you know I've been studying this for a while the the strategies of the Egyptian police does get adopted more broadly so yeah Leb so folks in Lebanon and Tunisia might be sort of looking out for this move to kind of like cyber crime or you know uh legislation that's um terrifying but sort of good to know as a kind of way to sort of start thinking about addressing it mm -hmm. um so we have a bunch of really fantastic questions and i want to sort of hit on there's a couple um thinking about sort of community work right and how this these kinds of this kinds of gathering of digital evidence and these kinds of like um street level surveillance um to use uh dia kagali's term i think uh, I think they coined that um, somewhat, you know, that's who I associate it with, um, uh, is um, uh, Walid asks, what are some strategies used to transition people back into the community once they're outed by police or legal system? Are people on a watch list or are they free to live as they once lived before? And then someone also asks, um, how is this affecting queer organizing? Like how are folks managing their activities within this context? So yeah, I'd love to hear how, um, this kinds of these kinds of digital sur surveillance are affecting folks um, in thinking about both community community life and organizing. Uh, yeah, I mean that question about what happens after and how that's it's a really depressing one, um, to be honest. Um, because especially talking to colleagues in the past and kind of bringing this sort of corporate responsibility angle to things, after someone gets an acquittal, it doesn't mean everything is fine. Oftentimes it means they've lost their job, it might mean they've lost their family, many people will come suicidal, a lot of people want to leave the country. 
um, we know more details about Sarah Hirazi's case, but um, there are so many cases that there is this sort of continued need of support and protection afterwards because it doesn't mean you get acquittal, then it's back to normal life. And I think that's one of the reasons when I was talking to um, community organizers and the NGOs, they were like, if we're talking to companies about this stuff, we need those security changes, we need those changes to come in, but we also need better legal funds to support people and um, for maybe if they're trying to claim asylum afterwards maybe they they need some psychosocial support there's a lot and we don't have that capacity to constantly do this and basically um fix their messes um and i think um a good point to bring in on that and i'm not a uh, authority to be answering this question on behalf of like the amazing NGOs on the ground that are doing this but um despite the challenges despite the um sort of constant surveillance street level surveillance whether it's for, for entrapments that sort of um threats that arise um in different formats the community thrives Queer communities have constantly, historically, um, have been creative and resistant and will continue to be creative and resistant and will not go invisible. So it continues, that organizing continues. What difference um, I'm seeing from the strategies of these incredible teams is that they're bringing in digital evidence um, sort of conversations, they're bringing in digital security conversations, they're bringing in discussions with companies and how to use things because it's not a question about stopping the use of technologies it's about how to start using technologies and stay connected to communities um more safely um so advocacy and all of this stuff continues and it will always continue because um that sort of um oppression like the quote that i gave from amashra Leila becomes a method of weaponizing the sort of the oppression of the oppression uh, the oppressor so um what i would say again i'm not the authority on this in relation to this is that people are just a lot more aware of what they need to be giving out in terms of um advice but I think as a part of like the um, project we had um, started with Article 19 and also this conversation about the responsibility of these companies who create tools who in with I'm sure with good intentions may come in and expand their tools in regions they don't know the context of have created such complex dangerous situations so that language is also happening a lot more um, that I'm seeing too. But yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. Um, you teed up right perfectly into, um, well, first of all, like, yes, um, to I think the, the, the amazing really like, like, I'm so glad you said that so directly and so beautifully around like the ways in which like, you know, this queer resistance has always will and always be and has always been, you know, sort of part of the survival strategy of uh, queer and trans and sex working communities, like the world, the world over. Um, I, yeah, I'd love to talk for a second um, about the kind of companies um, or the kind of like the, the ways in which um, these, uh, this might interact with social media platforms or sort of companies that are doing, that are creating apps or devices. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, I want to reemphasize something you've told me a lot, um, but just to like sort of start us off, which is that, you know, this isn't, oh, they're going to grinder and getting geolocation, uh, the police are going to grinder and getting geolocation information, or, you know, they're, you know, tapping people's phones, right? It's, you know, they literally have access to the device. So given that, um, and the police literally have access to the device, um, given that are, you know, what, uh, you know, and feel free to go back to the slide you showed at the end if you'd like, what should companies be doing? Um, like how can they provide support? Um, you know, is there lobbying they could advocate or things they could advocate for? And how does that interact with this idea of like queerness as a Western phenomenon? Um, mm -hmm. And then, yeah, I'll stop with, I'll, we'll, we'll do those two questions. And then if we get through those, I can go back to the list. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think like in the combined version, I can mention that, 
um, at least part of the work we've been doing and we're continuing with Article 19 in terms of um, looking at the way the communities are using these um, tools and how they're being arrested and targeted and we're just expanding the countries and that this digital evidence um, research where, where it's a look at the court files and the legal system and the courts themselves um, and the lawyers and the communities have very similar recommendations of what's wanted. And that's because there is there are similar issues of um, the data being so available when a device is confiscated. The difference being entrapment, like we mentioned, they already have access to that information prior to an arrest because they're creating this narrative and conversation and entrapping folks. But the sort of, um, changes they want to see from companies is having these cases and these um, issues in mind and providing these sort of um, strategies and features that allows them to one continue to use the tools because they want to why why wouldn't like if you're going to use it in the west we're going to use it in the middle east but we just need it to be contextualized better not everyone is queer in san francisco right now where a lot of like these tools might be made for example um so asking for um time messages let me try and bring that slide which is a good point with, with my attempt at bringing in a meme um so you know the sort of community-based verification working with the incredible technologists that we have on the team i think for example norman is in the um chat as well we we're constantly talking about how to bring in the wants and needs of communities in line with um issues that will protect their privacy and security further so having verification but having verification is community-based and not more intrusive of um people's privacy that again will protect against um police profiles on the different um apps pins and self-destruct this this is something that people want whether it's lawyers or whether it's the community members because it again um lowers the evidence that the police can rely on when they're doing these device searches if there's a way to have like double pins whether it's on whatsapp whether it's on facebook messenger whether it's on a queer dating app all your albums properly where you can like have levels of what they could have access to again you, so, you see from what we've provided though, how the um, cases are based um, on the limited information they find on these phones. Having less information provided to them is one of the things that the lawyers really, really bank on saying that if it didn't exist, we could win these cases. You know, disappearing messages because there wouldn't be this concept of a backlog of everything on the phone, for example, or if that people might not remember to delete, well, that happens to all of us, it's happened to me in US airports. Um, <laughs> direct line of communications with the legal teams and the communities, if someone is arrested, help them take their accounts down. We know there's now so much research that we have now that shows where they get all that information an immediate response to take these accounts down helps and so on so kind of that sort of um hopefully it answers it this sort of context of designing with these situations in mind ideally from the inception if not now that we have the data with them in mind it you know this is something we talk about all the time and hopefully it can develop more but it makes it for a better piece of technology for everyone, you know, and having these things, these incredible um, sort of pieces of advice on what's from these communities are really unique and creative things that everyone could enjoy, really. I think that that makes so much sense. And I think, you know, one example we've talked about is if you're sort of building in a separate album um, from, you know, from WhatsApp messages that also prevents um, back in the day where you would literally hand your phone to your grandma, maybe you're not doing that anymore. Or you, it's a <laughs> further, further distance if you are, but like, you know, showing, having your grandma swipe too far in your photo gallery and um, discover, you know, the uh, images some, somebody sent you on a dating app. Well, let's just call them that. Uh, so I think, you know, it, to your point about designing from from the margins being beneficial to everyone, right, like, you know, that you can, <laughs> the the tools that might allow someone from um, Egypt to uh, sort of refute uh, um, or get acquitted for a 
conviction might also save you from horrible embarrassment in front of your relatives. You know, everyone wins. Um, everyone wins, exactly. Um, so we're at time. I can't believe it because we have so many, there's still so many great questions and I have so many questions I want to ask, but I want to be respectful of Afsana's uh, time and of our, our uh, host time and of our, our attendees time. So I just want everyone to join me in thanking Afsana for the, this incredible presentation and like this incredible work um, and bringing it to us and the program on law and society um, for in the Muslim world. Um, uh, it, for having us and giving us a, a venue to present this. And, um, you know, Asana, uh, I know, welcomes questions, comments, uh, thoughts on this work. And you please send the webinar recording to all of your friends. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, everybody. Thanks for joining us and have a great day. Thank you so much. And Kendra, thank you so much for just everything and this incredible moderation in general. And thank you, everybody from the teams organizing this and, and our sponsors for this session. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.